on the broadcast tonight. It's been two weeks since Korea's tragic ferry capsized. As the death toll tops 200, tens of thousands of Korean mourners pay tribute to the victims. President Park Geun-hye apologizes over the government's initial response to the Silohul Ferry accident. And North Korea conducts live fire exercises near the de facto maritime border between the two Koreas. Early edition at 6 begins now. It is 5 a.m. in New York, noon in Kiev, and 6 on a Tuesday evening here in Seoul. This is Early Edition at 6, live from Seoul. I'm Moon Gon Young. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us for the newscast. The entire nation continues to grieve for the victims of the Seoul Ferry disaster. On this Tuesday, a large memorial altar opened at a park in Ansan, which is the city affected most by this terrible tragedy. Tens of thousands of people have paid respects to those that lost their lives on the ill-fated ferry over the recent days. Our correspondent is on site. Chi Myung Gil joins us live from Ansan Hwarang Memorial Hall. Myung Gil, uh, despite the gloomy weather, thousands have turned up to pay their respects. Good afternoon. This new memorial altar opened earlier this morning, and since then more than 11,000 people have come here to say their last goodbyes. As you can see behind me, there is a long line of people still waiting to get inside. In the morning, President Park geun visited the altar and paid tribute to the victims of the Seoul Ferry. She also spoke to the relatives of the victims. This altar replaces a temporary one that was set up last week at Ansan Olympic Memorial Hall and is six times larger. The altar displays 162 portraits of victims, including the 155 students and four teachers from Ansan's Tanon High School, who are either missing or dead. The shift to a more spacious location was to allow for more people to pay their condolences. Over the past six days, more than 180,000 people have visited the altars in the city. No, um, and Mianga, this more permanent altar, just like the temporary one that was set up for the past few days, it will be open to the general public, correct? Yes, that's right. The new memorial hall will be open 24 hours a day for, for anyone who wishes to come here and pay their respects. The new altar is run by the government and is jointly sponsored by the Ansan City and the Gyeonggi-do province. To handle the volume of people coming here, more than 30 shuttle buses are being used to help people get to and from nearby subway stations. There's also a huge parking lot with room for nearly 3,000 cars right next to the altar. People who can't make it here can instead send text messages or personal letters commemorating the victims. The messages are posted up on a bulletin board so they can be read by mourners paying their respects at the altar. This was Kim Young reporting live from Ansan Hwarang Memorial Altar. President Park Geun-hye has apologized to the nation for the Seoul Ferry accident, more specifically the government's poor initial response to the tragedy. She also said she will set up a national safety ministry under the prime minister's office to make sure the country is prepared for any and all disasters. Our Park Ji-won has more. President Park Geun-hye apologized on Tuesday to the public for the very disaster that continues to grip the nation. 
During a cabinet meeting on Tuesday, the president apologized to the people for the government's inability to prevent the accident in the first place and its handling of the situation early on. 이런 사고로 많은 고귀한 생명을 잃게 되어 국민 여러분께 죄송스럽고 마음이 무겁습니다. She said efforts to find the dozens of victims who remain unaccounted for is the most important task right now. To make sure such an incident doesn't take place again, President Park said she would create a national safety ministry under the prime minister's office. Once established, it would systematically and efficiently manage responses to both natural and man-made disasters. 국가 차원의 대형 사고에 대해서는 지휘 체계에 혼선이 발생하지 않도록 총리실에서 직접 관장하면서 부처간 업무를 총괄 조정하고 지휘하는 가칭 국가 안전처를 신설하려고 합니다. Earlier in the day, President Park Geun-hye visited the Ansan Hwarang Memorial Hall, where an altar has been set up for the victims of the ferry accident. She paid her respects to those who lost their lives and spoke to some of their families. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the National Assembly convened a plenary session this Tuesday to address this Hilo ferry accident. Lawmakers passed a resolution that calls for supporting those affected by the tragedy and helping with the investigation to determine its cause. Out of the 253 lawmakers that attended, all but three voted in favor of the resolution. They also agreed to donate 10 percent of their salary from the month of May to victims of the, family, to the, victims of the accident and their families. Lawmakers agreed that the primary focus now should be on finding those who remain unaccounted for. They also stressed the importance of punishing those responsible for the tragedy to the fullest extent of the law. The lawmakers also decided to forge ahead with the establishment of a memorial park and monument in Ansan, the city most affected by the disaster. It's been two weeks since the tragic solo ferry sunk off Korea's southwestern coast of Jindo Island. And the death toll has risen to 205, with 97 still missing and presumed dead. We now connect to our Connie Kim at the News Center for the latest. Connie, the weather has given rescue divers some trouble in recent days. Any progress today? Well, the weather conditions in Jindo seem to have improved as the clouds have cleared out and the waves are calmer than yesterday. However, it's a different story altogether under the surface of the water. The currents are stronger with speeds of up to 2.4 meters per second. And to help divers in the hostile environment, authorities had planned to deploy a diving bell this afternoon at around 5 p.m. Korea time, but they are having trouble doing so due to strong currents in the area. A diving bell is a chamber that can be used as a base for divers, enabling them to stay underwater for about an hour without having to return to the surface. Now, 16 more bodies were recovered today, pushing the death toll to 205, with 97 still unaccounted for. 13 of them were found in the lobby of the fifth floor, with the rest retrieved from the left side of the cabins on the fourth floor. The bodies are yet to be identified, but most are presumed to be Tanon High School students. Now, originally, the cabins on the right side of the vessel on the third and fourth floor were a priority, but the Coast Guard expanded its search to the fifth floor today, working on an assumption that people may have run upstairs from the fourth floor when the water began rushing in. So far, more than half of the 64 cabins where the missing passengers are presumed to have been have now been searched. Now the first phase of the rescue operations are expected to come to a close at the middle of next month. And Kanye, what about the ongoing criminal investigations? Uh, authorities appear to be casting a wide net. That's right, and they are focusing a lot of attention on the Seoul crew members who abandoned ship. The cases of the four ferrymates who have been arrested, including the vessel's first mate, known by his last name Kang, will be sent to prosecution. Kang reportedly called his employer, Chung Jin Marine Company, when the vessel was listing time he should have spent trying to save the ill-fated ferry and its passengers. Kang was also the one responsible for managing the amount of ballast water on the vessel, which is believed to be one of the factors that caused the ferry to capsize. Now, criticism against the crew who managed to evacuate is likely to expand as phone logs show that the crew, including Captain Lee Jun Seok, called Chung Jin Marine Company seven times prior to their escape from 9.01 to 9.37, 
just before the last communication with the control tower in Chindo Island at 9.39 a.m. Also this morning, the president of the Cheonghaejin Marine Company, Kim Han-sik, was summoned for the first time. He's being looked at for any links between Yu byung -an, the practical owner of the ferry operator. Investigations will be conducted to determine whether Kim was involved in any business irregularities, such as embezzlement and tax invasion in connection with Yu. Well, that's all for me from now, but I'll be back in about two hours with more updates. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best with Moon Gon Yong and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Now, North Korea ratcheted up tensions on the peninsula once again earlier this Tuesday afternoon in the form of live fire drills near the de facto inter Korean maritime border. The exercises, however, were short lived and lasted just about 10 minutes. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff has withdrawn evacuation orders for South Korean residents on five nearby border islands. President Park Geun-hye had told the South Korean military to respond firmly should any North Korean artillery shell happen to land in South Korean territory. Now, there were none of those. The two Koreas exchanged fire across the maritime border last month during a similar drill after more than 100 North Korean shells fell into South Korean waters. And what North Korea is also doing is talking up its nuclear and missile programs. Amid speculation, a fourth nuclear test could be on the cards. The North National Defense Commission said the regime has the capacity to carry out something bigger than a boosted fission nuclear weapons test or new intercontinental ballistic missile launch. Well, the statement did not provide further details, but Pyongyang took a swipe at the international community, saying its nuclear weapons program does not require approval from anyone. Well, it also said the regime would not dismantle the program under any circumstances. The statement was in response to U.S. President Barack Obama's comments last week during his visit to Seoul, in which he said Washington would never allow North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Now, shifting our focus to the economy, Korea posted a current account surplus for the 25th straight month in March on the back of firm auto and computer chip exports. Arirang's Hwang Ji-hye has an analysis of the economy's trade numbers as well as a forecast of the rest of the year. March was another bullish month for Korea in terms of its current account surplus. The nation's central bank said Tuesday that the surplus stood at over 7.3 billion U.S. dollars last month, up nearly $3 billion from February. Exports of goods rose almost 6 percent from the previous year to around $54 billion, helped by strong shipments in automobiles, semiconductors and telecommunication products. Imports went up slightly more than 3 percent to $46 billion. While the upbeat current account data supported by strong exports came largely from growing demand in advanced economies, exports to emerging markets remained subdued. Korea's exports aren't dependent on just one or two countries, so the recovery seen in advanced nations like the U.S. and the European Union should spread out to emerging economies in order for exports to see a boost. The nation's current account surplus has been working as a buffer for any potential capital outflow from Korea that might be triggered by the U.S. Federal Reserve's scale-back of stimulus measures. While the Bank of Korea forecasts the surplus for 2014 to reach $68 billion earlier this month, the number for the first quarter stood at over $15 billion. The central bank says the recent current account surplus trend is on track to meet its projection. Peng Jie, Arirang News. Thanks to higher demand for premium smartphones and televisions, the world's largest smartphone maker, Samsung Electronics, posted first quarter profits that beat provisional estimates. Our Kim Ji-yeon has more. 
Samsung Electronics turned in a better than expected first quarter profit. The Korea based smartphone maker posted an operating profit of roughly 8.2 billion US dollars in the first three months of this year. That is 2.1 percent higher than the fourth quarter of last year. The provisional estimates of earnings released by the company earlier this month were just shy of $8 billion. Sales numbers also inched up by 1.5 percent from a year earlier to about $52 billion. Samsung's IT and mobile business division, which makes up the lion's share of the company's overall revenue, posted operating profits of around $6.2 billion. That represents a turnaround from earnings in the fourth quarter of last year, which came in below the $5.8 billion mark. The recovery is due to better sales performances of Samsung's premium Galaxy devices, including the Galaxy S4 and the Note 3 tablet. The company shipped out 113 million units of mobile phones and tablet computers in the first quarter. Samsung's components parts division in charge of semiconductors also played a role in propping up earnings with $1.9 billion in first quarter operating profits. But the company's display division, which dominates the market for panels using organic light emitting diodes, posted an operating loss of $78 million over the period. Samsung Electronics says, however, expects a boost in the second quarter. The company says orders for display panels that are used for premium smartphones and TVs are expected to rise as new mobile devices are rolled out in time for the World Cup in Brazil in June. Korea-based LG Electronics, one of the world's largest television makers, also posted its earnings Tuesday. Its first quarter operating profit amounted to $489 million, a 44 percent increase from the same period last year. The company attributes the increased demand to global sporting events, including this year's Winter Olympics, during which consumers were looking for large screen sets with sharper displays. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Well, despite the strong first quarter, for the first time in four years, Samsung Electronics' share of the global smartphone market has dropped. U.S. market research firm Strategy Analytics said Tuesday that the Korean tech giant's share in the market in the first quarter came to 31.2 percent, down more than one percentage point on year. It represents the first decline since the fourth quarter of 2009. However, Samsung wasn't alone. Apple's slice of the pie plunged to 15.3 percent, down 2.2 percentage points. The research firm attributed the slumping numbers to increased competition in the market from second-tier smartphone makers like LG and Lenovo. The Kaesong Industrial Complex is one of the last remaining links of co cooperation between the two Koreas, with an eye on boosting inter-Korean collaboration and moving towards unification. South Korean businessmen with operations overseas plan to visit the industrial park in the coming days. Kim and bin reports on what many are hoping will be an investment opportunity with a return unlike any other. The World Federation of Overseas Korea Traders Association is looking to resume economic exchanges with North Korea. The chairman of World Okta, Kim Woo Jae, along with 21 association members from nine countries, are scheduled to visit the Kaesong Industrial Complex in the north on May 2nd to discuss future investments and plans to establish factories there. Kim said the trip is designed to contribute to reunification of the two Koreas by promoting economic cooperation and hopefully revitalizing inter Korean exchanges. A total of 41 people are expected to make the trip, including the chairman of the Overseas Korea's Foundation, Cho gi Hyung, and 13 CEOs. World Octa said Tuesday that it first initiated the plan back in February and recently got approved from the two Koreas, adding that it had given business proposals in advance to the North. World Octa is the largest overseas Korean business organization, and several firms are currently in business relationships with the North. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. Well, fine dust and air pollution are no longer a problem limited to one country. 
With the quality of air worsening by day, it really has become an issue that knows no borders, no nationalities. An annual environment ministers meeting between Seoul, Beijing, and Tokyo is currently underway in Korea's southeastern city of Tegu. And topping the agenda there is expected to be air pollution. So for an in-depth analysis, Professor Yi Hee Guan joins us live via Skype. He is a professor of environmental engineering at Incheon National University. Professor Lee, thank you for joining us. Now, at this year's tripartite environment ministers meeting, uh, the three countries will try to come up with a joint effort to fight air pollution, and more specifically, the fine dust problem from China. Uh, what solution were discussed at this meeting? Um, the, rather the first, firstly, I mean, the, we can expect some like more action, but you know, the I would say, uh, for the moment, you know, the um, the sitting together, I mean, you know, that those three countries are the most was the big for the importance you know the um there are some kind of like a, the um common sense i mean to deal with uh, this was the air quality issue in asian region so it was the most important aspect um, for this meeting professor when these fine dust particles accumulate in our bodies what kind of health problems can it cause um the Usually we call it like a PM 2.5 or the PM 10 as the, the uh, fine particle and ultra fine particle. And because of the, our the uh, human inhalation system, you know, the, um, those particles are ranged from like a two to three a micrometer um, will be, I mean, you know, the, um, the accumulate in uh, the uh, human breathing system. So the, uh, the main, um, it, then, you know, the, it, it'll like uh, the, um, the, Step down, you know, the, in in uh, long and obvious, that'll be the, the beginning of the um, you know the um, breathing problem. Well, uh, Professor Lee, surveys show that air pollution in Korea is really among the worst compared to other OECD member states, and and the level of fine dust particles, particularly, it seems to soar in April here in Korea. What, why is that the case? Um, the Regarding this word, the um, airborne fine particle issue, um, obviously, you know, we have the, our own source, I mean, inside, as well as some others from, like, we call it the transboundary, uh, meaning that, you know, the um, transfer uh, from the long range, like uh, um, the inland China or the further side. Um, but basically, you know, the, um, those are uh, um, the, were the main part of the, um, the air pollutant. And, you know, the, um, you know, uh, I think that's it. Well, Korea and China have uh, recently agreed to work together in tackling fine dust from China. What have they done so far, and is it going to be effective? Yeah, I mean, I even my personal, I mean, I have been to the Beijing a couple of weeks ago um, to deal with, to have discussion about this world air pollution issue. And still, um, the um, Chinese um, has been changing a lot recently. And you know, before I mean, it was very hard to communicate with them, you know, because of different were the uh, system. But nowadays, you know, that they understand was the um, their own air quality problem, and you know, so the um, we also some like common understanding. So the um, so far, I would say uh, we've done some like a research activity um, for the regional air quality, and I think it's time for us to uh, make it real, more practical. Um, to um, help each other and also to improve the um, air quality in the region. So that was the most important part. Sure. Um, so, uh, Professor Lee, um, tell us, what can we do in our everyday lives to better protect ourselves from respiratory diseases uh, that are caused by fine dust? Um, in general, um, I would say there is not uh, much chance um, for us to do something with um, this or the air quality issue. Rather, you know, we can just stay um, ourselves inside um, to avoid the air pollution issue. But rather, you know, the, recently um, there are some the, um, people are using some the the, um, the mask and some other things, but still it's not the perfect answer. So main thing is um, we can just like uh, the um, limit or our the outdoor activity and some other personal issue. It was like a so far um, in the choice that we have got. Okay, Professor Lee, thank you so much for your insights tonight. Sure, thank you.
Well, it was a rather gloomy day all across the nation today. And very rainy down in Jindo, where search efforts continue on the Sewilho Ferry. Let's turn now to our Michelle Park to find out whether conditions are going to improve for divers down off Korea's southwestern coast. Michelle. Well, the conditions in Jindo were less than satisfactory for search teams today, and stronger winds and currents are forecasted uh, for tomorrow. And with spring tide periods beginning, that's sure to complicate the divers' attempts to recover the victims. Now, for the rest of the nation, a low pressure front from the west is affecting the whole nation with rain that will last until tomorrow. And a heavy rain warning was issued a few hours ago in the city of Sancheok, Gangwondo province. Now, tomorrow we can expect a mostly cloudy skies and chilly day, and also make sure to have an umbrella handy for uh, the on and off showers. Now, going over to our readings, Seoul tops out at 12 before reaching up to 21 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will get up to 19 and 18 degrees. Now, moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 18, Dokdo at 17, while Mangkumgang tops out at 10. Well, that's all I have for you tonight. I'm Michelle Park, and back to you guys. That brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for watching. For our viewers in Korea, have a wonderful rest of the evening. And a great start of the day to those of you in other parts of the world. This has been Sean Lim. And I'm Moon Gon Young. We hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow. Bye bye.